Smarter crowdsourcing as a process helps you get at very actionable and implementable solutions very quickly in situations of crisis. And by making the whole process open, it improves the legitimacy of, of the solutions that are coming through the process as well. And that really is the power of smarter crowdsourcing. Whether it's the spread of COVID or a volcano erupting, governments have a duty to protect their citizens from harm. But often, crisis response groups fail to effectively solve complex problems. To boost government's problem-solving skills, a new approach combines the complementary expertise of diverse, hand-picked experts to identify practical and impactful ideas. Hi, I'm Stephen Boucher, co-editor of the Handbook of Collective Intelligence for Democracy and Governance and founder of Democracy and Smarter Together. In today's talk with Anirudh Dinesh, research fellow at the Governance Lab, you'll learn how forward-thinking governments in South America improved their response to COVID by harnessing small groups of diverse and vetted experts. The importance of accurately defining problems and questions and why complementary experts are the key to producing actionable policy recommendations. My name is Anirudh Dinesh. I'm a research fellow with the Governance Lab and the Burns Center for Social Change. At the GovLab, we help institutions, including governments, improve people's lives by changing the way we govern and by using new technologies to make smarter, more collaborative, participatory decisions in the way that we solve public problems. So the problem that smarter crowdsourcing solves is in situations of crisis, especially when you're dealing with things like pandemics or natural disasters, governments struggle to find the right expertise quickly in order to respond to these situations. And so smarter crowdsourcing is a way to get global expertise uh, from people who have done the kind of work that we're looking to implement in our own situations to respond to the crisis. And so it's a way of rapid crowdsourcing, not in the way that you would normally do crowdsourcing, but by adding a layer of curation to make sure you're getting the right type of information in a limited time frame. So the traditional way of responding to a crisis is to set up some sort of committees to try and identify solutions to solve these problems. The challenge that committees will face very often is that you're only able to reach out to the usual suspects in a way that does not bring together diverse perspectives that are often very important to respond to crises. They're usually firehosed with ideas from all over the place that are hard to implement in the moment. It becomes a struggle really to find exactly what works in that situation. For example, when we did the smarter crowdsourcing for COVID-19 recently, the thing that becomes very apparent is that it's not just a public health emergency. There's a mental health crisis, there's supply chain issues with PPE, there's issues of communication and misinformation. These are all uh, domains where people have, in other contexts, been designing solutions that could be very helpful for us in responding to COVID-19. And so breaking down a large problem like COVID or Zika into these constituent root causes helps you bring together the epidemiologist with the social media influencer or the game designer who is an expert in gamification and behavior change with the mental health expert, the sanitation and hygiene expert with the doctors. And so putting together all of these people who have different skills in the same conversation helps you bring many diverse perspectives very quickly that will prove very helpful in, in tackling the crisis. So smarter crowdsourcing is a new way of doing crowdsourcing in which we add a layer of curation to the people who are invited to participate in the crowdsourcing effort. It starts off by breaking down large complex problems, whether it's a natural disaster like an earthquake or a volcano erupting somewhere or a global pandemic or complicated issues like corruption, breaking down those large problems into their constituent root causes. Once you break those down, you then try and bring the relevant experts from those fields into a online expert consultation session and have a free-flowing conversation where they're not sharing opinions about the problem, but sharing their real expertise and ideas for implementation of the ideas that they're bringing in response to the problem at hand. Once the online conferences are done, we then turn all the recommendations that came in through that conference into action memos for policymakers to be able to easily implement the ideas that were raised in the session. An important element of the smarter crowdsourcing process is how the online sessions are designed. These are moderated two hour long sessions 
within the session, we have the experts who are invited to participate. And we have the partners typically from the governments and, and uh, nominated by the governments to attend these sessions. And so there is someone at the other end, a decision maker, who is listening to the conversation and trying to provide the experts with the local context that is important so that the recommendations that the experts are making are relevant to the situation. But beyond that, the government partners are there to listen to the suggestions. And then if they have follow-up questions about any of the specific ideas, we will then follow up with the people who made those suggestions to give them more information. The outputs of the conferences are usually five or eight solid recommendations with information about the resources necessary, both financial and time and human resources, to implement these solutions that have come up. And so what comes out of the smarter crowdsourcing process is solid, actionable, implementable ideas for policymakers to use. Traditional crowdsourcing as it was done 10 or 15 years ago, where you put up an open text box on the internet and ask people for suggestions in response to a very large and broad question, throws up some challenges. One is the volume of responses you get sometimes is unmanageable and not implementable. The other is you will get a lot of nasty, funny, troll, troll type comments because you've put up an open text box on the internet. And interesting and sort of famous example of this is when the White House put up uh, an online consultation which invited people to suggest policy changes that the, the White House should make. Uh, one of the top suggestions that came from the public and one of the most popular ones was to build the Death Star from Star Wars. And these are not the kind of ideas we're looking for in situations of crisis. We're looking for uh, actions that can be taken immediately. So adding one level of curation and making the questions you're asking of experts very precise uh, helps us really narrow down the kind of recommendations and suggestions that we're getting from, from the crowd. So the smarter crowdsourcing process begins first with the problem definition phase. Our team, in consultation with our government partners and other partners, like in the case of the uh, COVID-19 smarter crowdsourcing, the Inter-American Development Bank, we make a problem catalog of about 20 or 30 root causes of the problem at hand. We then prioritize with the government partners and with our project partners a list of four to six of the most urgent of those problems. We then prepare a problem brief on those four to six topics, which provides information about the problem, breaking it down further into more root causes, actions that have already been taken by the governments to tackle these problems, the challenges that they have faced in the past, and put together a problem brief for each of the six topics that have been identified. Then we go out and curate experts based on these problem briefs with an eye towards making sure that the expertise we're inviting is interdisciplinary and diverse. After the problem definition phase is over, we're then trying to identify who are the relevant experts to bring in to this process. So we are trying to identify people not necessarily with traditional credentials or, or degrees or titles. We're looking for people who have experience actually building things and implementing things. And so we're looking for not just academics and researchers, but also people running startups and civil society organizations and NGOs who are doing work on the ground uh, in response to the challenges that we've identified in the problem briefs. We will then ask them also to forward the invitation to their networks to invite people who they think might be relevant to the conversation. We will allow guests to self-select themselves if they feel that they have something to contribute to the problem at hand. And so through all of these different outreach efforts, what we're trying to really get at is a list of 15 or 20 people who can bring together diverse perspectives on the issue at hand for the 90 to 120 minutes online expert consultation. One of the recommendations uh, that came out of this kind of interdisciplinary collaboration is when we did smarter crowdsourcing in response to the Zika virus. Uh, Zika is a mosquito-borne disease and mosquitoes breed in standing water. And during the conversation, one of the experts who was online said, standing water typically accumulates in trash cans that are overfilled. And so there's a few ways to solve this problem, but probably the simplest way is to identify where trash cans are overflowing and either have more pickup routes in that area to make sure that trash cans are not overflowing or to build larger trash cans in those places. And so the solution that was identified in the end was to find the uh, places where trash cans are overflowing on the streets of Argentina and to replace them with larger trash cans. So 
very actionable concrete solutions in response to a problem that was identified by narrowing down root causes from the large problem of Zika to uh, on the ground realities. The top recommendation to any crowdsourcing effort is the importance of problem definition. Defining the problem in a narrow manner is really the first step of any effective crowdsourcing effort. What it lets you do is to identify experts that you would normally not approach uh, because you haven't looked at a problem in its holistic way. So making sure you're doing a very thorough job of the problem definition and identifying the root causes in consultation with uh, people who know the topic well is, is a very important first step. So being collaborative, even at the stage of problem definition, uh, is I think the number one kind of recommendation. The second is when we're doing uh, the curation of the experts, we're trying to strike a balance between having a small number so that it's a manageable conversation online, but also having diverse perspectives. So making sure that the expert list that we're inviting does bring in diverse perspectives and does bring in diverse skill sets is an important step in the smarter crowdsourcing process. The third recommendation when you're doing online consultations is to take advantage of all the modes of communication that are at your disposal. So there is the obvious video and audio communication that's happening with the people on the call, but most of our online conferencing tools also have a chat, a text-based chat box, where we encourage experts to share links to resources, react to the conversation that's happening. And so we're having conversations in three dimensions. We're having the face-to-face -face conversation with the person who is speaking at the moment, but also getting some reactions and responses and pushbacks in some cases, which is very useful deliberation in the chat. So making use of the audio, video, and text is super effective and making sure that people are able to dial in by phone so that you're able to invite experts who might be bandwidth limited and, and might have challenges with the internet. So making that process inclusive by providing multiple ways for people to join the conversation. When we did smarter crowdsourcing for COVID-19, we had government partners from Argentina and Brazil and Peru and seven Latin American countries speaking three different languages. So we needed English, Portuguese, and Spanish. And so making sure that the online export consultation also made translations available, live translations available, so that everybody can participate in the language that they're most comfortable in was also a very important thing for including a diverse range of experts. So if you're interested in doing a smarter crowdsourcing yourself, first, we have our website, smartercrowdsourcing.org, where we have a detailed playbook of how we run a smarter crowdsourcing from the problem definition to writing the action memos, all described there. You're more than welcome to get in touch with us by email, and we're happy to help you implement smarter crowdsourcing in your own jurisdiction, if that's something you're interested in. To find out more about how collective intelligence can make our democracy stronger, go to our website, Smarter Together. There you will find all the handbook's 30 plus case studies and other resources all for free.